Victorian times were a period of transition for humanity. The period happens to be the melting pot of modernization of technology and archaic traditions, which created some interesting and grim results of how creative but woeful human minds can get. The police force was starting to take a formal shape, but the Victorian prisons were still harsh and poor to survive in like the Middle Ages. The pain and punishment during the Victorian era were still unacceptable, but the methods benefited from the advancement of technology, which didn't bode well for those tested on. Welcome to Nutty History. In today's video, we're going to find out what punishment was like in the Victorian era. Viewer discretion is advised for this video, as some of this video may be offensive or disturbing. We, the makers of this video, in no way support or condone the actions of the subjects featured. Simple, effective, and one of the safest of exercising equipment, the treadmill is a popular and high-selling machine that is common not only in gyms, but in a lot of households too. So it may come as a shock that the origins of this much adored piece of equipment is still dark and gritty and can chill anyone's bones. The treadmill in its modern version first appeared during the Victorian era, but not for the purpose it is used today. Back then, it wasn't an activity, but one of the most wicked punishments. In 1817, Sir William Cubitt wasn't happy with the state of British prisons, as most prisoners were sitting idle for most of the day. As they say, an idle mind is the devil's workshop, and lack of business among prisoners had Sir Cubitt worried. To keep prisoners occupied and toiled, he came up with a new kind of mill that would grind air instead of corn. With resistance provided by a system of weights, 19th century penal treadmills resemble large and wide wheels that had steps affixed to them. Prisoners were forced to climb these stairs repeatedly, which would cause the rotation of the wheel. Multiple persons could climb a single treadmill at once and were given handheld bars for support, and sometimes were separated by partitions, as was the case at the Vagrant's Prison in Colbath Fields. According to academic Vibar Cregan Reed, Sir Cubitt's penal treadmills were the perfect method of punishment by Victorian standards. This was hard labor, but had no productivity about it. Apparently, the exhaustive pointlessness was religiously ideal as in the eyes of the authority. The real fruit of hard work here was atonement. Prisoners had to walk or climb the treadmill for a minimum of six hours every day, during which they would climb an average of 10 to 14,000 feet. This punishment, if harnessed for energy at the time, would have produced hundreds of watts, ranging from 300 to 1,000. The highest record of most climbing was held by prisoners of Warwick Jail, who walked an incredible amount of 17,000 feet in a single day over a span of 10 hours, and they did it in the blazing heat of peak summer. If you are questioning, wasn't treadmill walking healthy for the prisoners? We all have heard stories of how some people get swollen in prisons because of investing a lot of their sentence time in fitness. But modern prison scenarios do not apply to Victorian prisons, which were not very keen on keeping their prisoners healthy or alive. The celebrity prisoner of Pentonville Prison, famed writer Oscar Wilde, nearly walked himself to death by treading these treadmills day in and day out. Sentenced to two years of hard labor in prison for indecency, Oscar Wilde was only 41 when he was incarcerated and was freed in 1897 when he was 44. The treatment at the prison, including the treadmill, left him so broken that the poor Irish poet succumbed two years later in Paris. Treadmills would not only greatly reduce prisoners' social interaction time, but they would also confine them in a very limited space. For many, life in prison meant spending the day on the treadmill and night in their little cell. Indeed, such an environment would be heavily taxing on mental health. Prisoners were hurting physically as well. Climbing nearly 12,000 steps every day would easily burn 2,000 or much more calories off each prisoner. But the rations of these prisons were a far cry from replenishment, leaving them malnourished and exhausted. But back in 1875, the British government held the treadmills responsible for improving prison discipline considerably nationwide. The Society for Improvement of Prison Discipline also hailed these machines for being effective as a preventive measure. However, it seems the death of Oscar Wilde didn't make some impact, and the use of these machines was abolished in 1902. Ireland's freedom movement is one of the darkest chapters of the United Kingdom's history. In the 18th century, the Irish population was inspired by the French Revolution. Some Irishmen set up the Society of United Irishmen in Belfast in October 1791, 
intending to bring democracy to Ireland. The society met fierce suppression from the government from the onset and was driven underground, but the members kept the society alive in secret. The tension between the authorities and the society grew to the apex in 1798 and rebellion broke out in and around Dublin. Though the Irish had spirit, they were poorly armed and poorly led because most of the United Irish leaders were in prison during the insurgency. The fighting in the 1798 rebellion lasted just three months, but tens of thousands had perished. A high estimate of the death toll is 70,000, and the lowest one puts it at about 10,000. Authorities cracked down hard on confirmed rebellions and suspects alike, and the oppression continued during the Victorian times too. In attempts to weed out the clandestine United Irish society, British authorities tried everything. From ongoing public punishments to offering amnesty and full pardons, they tried to bribe the imprisoned members of the organization in every possible way. But there was another side of this coin as well. Long before they offered rewards, they used many forms of pain to convince members and suspects without any difference. These punishments continued to be a bane of the Irish for over a century. The usual methods of convincing enforced by the British were flogging, half-hanging, and picketing. While flogging is a term that almost everybody is familiar with, half-hanging was a sick game of letting them dangle but cutting them down before life left their body. They will then help the prisoner to get back on their feet and then repeat the excruciating and appalling process many times. Picketing was the process of placing the bare soles on pegs, driven into the ground with their pointed ends uppermost. Their whole weight was therefore supported on the most sensitive part and it would inflict unbearable pain. While these horrible means of punishment were common, pitch clapping was kept for special occasions. The process involved pouring hot tar into the pitch cap, a conical cap shaped very similar to a clown's cap. This cap was then placed onto one's said head, allowed to cool, and then removed rapidly. Although it was traditional for men to be bareheaded in church, it was said that Irish priests made an exception for survivors of pitch capping to cover their scarred scalps with a handkerchief. In the 19th century, a report by the Education Department of the British government reported that the educational system wasn't doing so well in Wales. Citing the Welsh children had little motivation to study or get educated and were living in bad conditions. The Victorian era British decided that the reason for such poor education standards has to be the lack of English in their education system. So they came up with a punishment system to dissuade Welsh children from speaking Welsh. A piece of wood plaque inscribed with the letters WN was crafted to hang around the neck of children who were caught speaking Welsh in school. However, there was only one plaque for all the children in school, and that's where this punishment became sadistic. If the person who currently had the plaque caught someone else speaking Welsh, the first offender could pass the Welsh not plaque to the second offender. The plaque would be passed around Welsh children for the entire day like a wicked version of hot potato as Welsh students would turn on each other to avoid wearing the plaque at the time the final bell of the school would ring. At the end of the day, whoever had the plaque around their neck would be punished by school authorities. This punishment served the British divide and rule policy wonderfully at a micro level. The British Army abolished the use of flogging as a punishment method in 1881. Until then, Flogging was the standard punishment for minor offenses, such as drunkenness or failing to perform duties timely. Faced with the challenge to invent a new punishment form to replace flogging, British officials came up with field punishment number one. Depending on the degree of the offense, an offender would be tied up to a mast or worse, a wheel and wasn't allowed to slouch or relax. A military officer was assigned to check on the posture of the offender on a regular basis and disobeying the command meant an increase in the punishment time. The punishment survived until 1920 and was considered life-threatening as offenders would be often tied up in plain view, subjecting them to shell fire. No wonder the punishment was abolished in the very first year of the First World Battle. Do you think we missed any horrible Victorian punishments? If so, tell us in the comments below and make sure to like and subscribe. As always, thanks for watching Nutty History.